then started showing symptoms, and we had some rapid tests that we could do here. Well, it, it was the whole unit. We had to move that whole unit down to the cascade or down to the um, COVID unit. And those are dementia patients, you know, it made the, their behaviors worse, and they were so sick. Um, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, I have, I have taken care of people with the flu for years. You don't lose 20 plus people in a month time from the flu. We lost 20 some people. I mean, I could come in in the morning and the person would be okay. And by nighttime they were dead. You know, we did what we had to do to take care of our residents. Um, did you lose any, any, did any staff people quit? Um, we had a few, and that's fine, um, because I, the one thing that this, um, this uh, virus has showed me is um, the people that are here right now are the ones that stuck through it all, and they're the ones that I want to keep. Yeah. Um, you know, they're the ones that worked beside me. I mean, I had a nurse that was scared to death to work down there, but she worked down there. She went in the bathroom and cried for a little bit, and then she came out. And she did it every day. Um, they were scared. We were all scared. Um, you know, everybody has family, a family at home. Um, you know, we didn't know. We're seeing all these people die, and we don't know what it's going to do to us. Any uh, PTSD on this, you think? Like, like cause I talked to Bets many, oh, many times. Uh, yes, yes, I can definitely. I, I, yeah, I mean, if if our residents start getting sick again, um, I think we're all going to have a nervous breakdown because it just, you don't forget that. You don't no. forget all those people in those rooms. And, like, we would put two people in a room that were dying so that way we could sit with both of them and... And it's almost like you have, you'd have to work on the units for me to, it's hard for me to explain, but coming from like a, a typical med surge floor and you know, you're doing your normal thing, it's, it can be stressful, but it's, it's decent. But when you go to a COVID unit, it's like, I even, my first time working on the COVID unit, I looked at the staff nurses who are normally over there and I said, I don't know how you ladies do it. I'm just the PPE part of it was hard for me because you've got your N95, which is suffocating enough. And then you have to wear like a face shield. You're putting on these gowns and the gowns, it's almost like they hold in heat. And you're in these rooms for like over sometimes an hour because they want you to do cluster care. They want you to do everything at once to minimize how many times you have to go in there. People to stay strong through the whole thing and just be there for one another instead of feeling like there's no end to it. I, that was my biggest thing. Like people were so depressed because of it. And it, it was just really disheartening because, you know, like not, nobody knew how to deal with it. And, it, you know, it's just trying to support one another and stay strong and A lot of them had like stroke-like symptoms, delirious. So they would just be out of their minds. And then they would just slowly die. Yeah. So or you... what happened in New York, what they did then was they traked <laughs> them all. Not all, but a lot of them they traked. And then they were like, what do we do with all these trach patients? <laughs> Oh my like, God. Where, do they, where do they go now? Like, we've, like, now saved these people. Like, we currently have a patient in our unit that's had COVID. Like, he's COVID recovered, but his lungs are, like, sponge. This is when it was really bad. Like, you ran out of um, dialysis machines. So a lot of the patient's kidneys shut down. You, like, kind of 
like you just like go into autopilot and you just like do it. Like there's no like you can't really be like that emotional. It's frustrating, I think, because it was it's still happening. And like a lot of my coworkers like didn't go home. Like they stayed like, you know, in the dorms on campus and stuff for months because they didn't want to take it home to their families. A state law reads for coroners, we're only involved if a case is obviously traumatic, uh, obviously a suicide or homicide, anything suspicious, uh, anything involved in people who live like in a jail or another um, home run by the state and kids that are two years and under. Actually, I was just at my suicide prevention meeting at lunchtime today, and we went over our final end of the year statistics, and we had exactly the same number in 2020 as we had in 2019, which was, I think, 22 cases. Wow. Um, so we had the same. We had no increase. We had no decrease. And just discussing suicides with um, different medical examiners around the country they're seeing the same thing um, in general, at least the ones that respond back and forth on the chat room, anywhere from 10 or 15% decrease in suicides to about a 10 or 15% increase. But in general, it doesn't seem to be much different, uh, you know, anecdotally. The, our business uh, for when it when when the numbers got really big um, in our area um, over November December January um, our business was probably double and sometimes triple the normal load that was we'd be dealing with families that some of them could come to make arrangements but some couldn't because some of them have COVID. You've been trained. You've been experienced, and you know how to handle the grieving process from a family. Right. And, and then you're thrown this whole different perspective on how the family's going to react. And, and you've got so many of them at the same and, time. And that is, that was the, the challenge. And everybody handles it a different way. Everybody has a different spiritual background. Everybody has a different belief. Uh, and, and let's face it, everybody grieves in a different way. Um, so trying to accommodate all of those different grieving habits or or beliefs um some have some uh, some of the families we dealt with had a spiritual connection to a church others did not um so some were dealing with the pastoral care at the nursing home or the hospital some didn't have any kind of pastoral care or spiritual care or guidance from a church or a pastor um and so you became so, you became it so we 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 kind of step in and, and do everything we possibly can. So it, it, it's taken a community, in my opinion, it's taken uh, a lot of different moving parts to kind of get the community through this. Uh, the nursing homes have helped drastically, the, the churches, the local pastors. I have a younger son, I have two older children. So my younger son ended up having to quarantine with me on his whole entire Christmas break. Oh. Um, my boyfriend, he's on dialysis and he ended up getting it December 30th. Oh, and he ended up going to St. V's and he was on the vet from January 3rd until January, I believe 18th. Oh my gosh. And actually he coded in the middle of that. Um, and then, but he's home now. Like he had to go to the St. Francis for eight days for rehab. So I kind of went through what my residents' families went through because when I was on my quarantine, I had to rely on the nurses at 
St. Vincent's to give me a report and let me know how he was doing because I wasn't able to see him either. And he coded, which means he started he, he flatlined. Correct. I was at one of my son's basketball games and the doctor called me and told me that they had brought him back by CPR. How did you fight the despair every day? And then you had to deal with your with your boyfriend and, and, and your son and everything. How did you do that? How did you do that, Jennifer? I I just go through my day and try to make them feel the best that I can. You know, they're like my family. I treat them like my grandmas and my grandpas and my mom and my dad. It was, this is part of our job. And we just had to do it. April 20th is when I started active duty uh, to support the, the food banks. Uh, when I first came on in, in April, I was the officer in charge at the Toledo Northwestern Ohio Food Bank, uh, obviously in Toledo. Um, and we had, oh, I don't know, approximately 30, 30 soldiers, 25 to 30 uh, soldiers at that point that were working in the food bank, replacing uh, the volunteers that, that weren't, couldn't be at the food bank or wouldn't be at the food bank uh, to support it. Um, the food banks primarily run on, on volunteers as a not-for-profit organization. Right. Um, and most of their volunteers are elderly, retired folks that, that are in that at-risk category that couldn't leave their homes or wouldn't leave their homes out of uh, just the sensibility of, of everything. We're, given the fact that everything's shut down and you can't get donations anymore, or hardly any donations because people are so much in need, where's the food come from? And the demand is higher, and yet the food's not going to be there available, will it? So, actually, there was an increase in donations. Really? Because uh, when the, the bars and restaurants were shut down, those restaurants already had orders put in for, for the next week or the next two weeks. And that food still showed up. But then the restaurants had no need for it. I mean, sure, yeah, some of the restaurants were doing carryout. And you could order order and, and do carryout. But the restaurants weren't using the amount of food that they had ordered. Okay. And, and the only way to just not throw it out for them to make good use of it was to then donate it to the food banks. There was a, a guy that had already uh, come through and gotten food from us. It, it was at a, a library in Toledo. Um, he had already gotten his food. When I pulled into the parking lot, he was sitting at a picnic table over outside the library. The library was closed, so he couldn't actually go in. Um, and he came back over and and you know, as he was as he was walking up, I walked over to him and, and started talking to him. And he says, hey, I already came through and, and got food. I just wanted to come back and say thank you. And he starts telling me a story. He was living out of his car. He, and this was, this was probably late June, maybe early July. Um, and so obviously a, a few months into the, into the pandemic, he lost his job the first week of the pandemic. Um, and he was, so he couldn't afford his uh, rent payment each month. So he was evicted from his apartment, didn't have food, didn't have a job, and he was literally living out of his car. Wow. And, and he had no idea, that, that was the first time he had gotten food from us. And he had no idea that the food bank was doing this. Wow. And he came up and, and I mean, not just a tear in his, in his eye, but tears. Yeah, we, we really were very proud of how long we, we're still very proud of the fact that we were able to keep it out so long exactly but it's just when it finally did hit us that's when it really hit us and it took a huge emotional toll on all of us how many people how fast did it spread do you know how many, like how many days did it go from one person to more 
it, it spread around our staff a little bit before it ever hit a resident, but once it hit one resident, it hit them all. Oh. Within weeks, all of our residents had it. Wow. I think on my hall, we only have one resident who never got it. What are some of the symptoms that you noticed right away from the residents? We did a whole lot of research because we wanted to know everything we could know and everything to look for. And one of the things that saved us and made us catch it quick is we learned to check their eyes because their eyes get red. They were independently walking. And then when, as time went on, they were two total assist to transfer. Then they were in bed, and then that was the end of them. Typically, we have about 35 mid thirties overdoses a year. So that's about three a month. Okay. And I don't recall exactly, but we probably had seven or eight, maybe nine in May. Wow. So we had a high amount in one month compared to usual. And then it was approached to us by the police because they were seeing a lot of overdoses on the street that survived. And they were chalking it up to people getting their stimulus checks. Um, about April or May is when they got stimulus checks. And so certainly that's not been proven or anything by us, but we did see that one month and it was very soon after the stimulus checks came. Now, so when they came right after the first of the year this year, the very first week we had two or three overdoses. And I'll, and I'll tell you, um, I talked to a lot of EMA directors who uh, did not have counties that work together. And I'm talking about the leadership, and they just had a real struggle this past year. And our leadership in Seneca County has been lockstep in one direction the entire time. Uh, it, it's amazing to see. Well, you guys did a great job. It's so much easier. Because you know, what you don't, sometimes you don't notice what you don't see. You know, the lack of a negative is hard to, is hard to, to recognize sometimes. Right, right. You know, but you're right. You know, we had all this, this calamity in November, December, and, and, and I didn't hear anybody panicking. There's no one, you know, you had things under control. You anticipated it. You know what's going to happen. And we wrote it through, and the place didn't go crazy. And that's a, that's a big deal. Not so scared anymore. Um, I remember the first patient I took care of that, because uh, it's a lot to remember, you know, when they're hitting their call light or they're about to climb out of bed because they, they have dementia, they don't realize that they have to stay in bed, mm -hmm. you know, because they're too weak to stand. All they know is I'm not in familiar surroundings and I want to get out of this bed. Right. So we have them in a room, you know, by themselves. We all we, we can see them through a window and we have a camera on them that's supposed to alert us that, hey, they're getting out of, we got a bed alarm on them, you know, that they're getting out of bed. Well, you know, you hear that alarm going off. So if you're in with another patient, you know, you got to stop what you're doing, run over to the, there's a little, what they call an ante room, you know, before, before to where they keep all the equipment, all the, all the uh, PPE we have to put on. And you're trying to put all that stuff on in a hurry and hope to God they haven't gotten that far out of bed, whether they pulled out their IV. You oh. know, so, so I got my gown on, I got my, my, I got my mask on, I got my gloves, all this stuff. I walk in there and then I realize, oh crap, I didn't have my goggles on. A health department calls me, or not a health department, I'm sorry. They called me the next day. It was occupational health. They called me the next day, and they were telling me, well, we understand that you went in there without your goggles on. Now, how close did you get to the patient before you, you know, realized you didn't have your goggles? I said, I took, like, two steps into the room. I was maybe, maybe seven feet away from the patient, you know. 
And, and because I was scared to death, I'm like, oh my God, it's floating in the air. It's going to get on my eyeballs. I'm going to get COVID, you know, I yeah. probably brought it home to my family. But um, nothing, I mean, they just told me I should be okay just to be more careful next time. I didn't get in any trouble, but I mean, I just remember that heart stopping moment. What would you like them to, the viewer of your artwork to walk away with in terms of impact on this? What would you like them to say, this is what my view of COVID has been, or this is what I think, I, I wish you would walk away with this feeling. What would it be? Yeah, you know, um, I guess just uh, off the top of my head, I, I envision um, kind of COVID, kind of the way, uh, basically the wave of COVID coming in and you know, causing death, causing social destruction, causing social isolation, and, um, you know, the development of vaccine, healthcare workers struggling to keep up, but then um, kind of a combination of, of healthcare workers continuing on, you know, not, uh, you know, abandoning ship, but if anything, getting stronger, vaccine coming, and um, life becoming the new normal.